Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hi everyone, I'm Jean Young, and today I'm going to be talking about how to make it easier for the programmer to enforce privacy policies and things like social networks, as Andre said. And so we all agree by now that privacy matters. People are putting more and more data online, and programmers have to deal with all of that. And also, people often get it wrong. So even Facebook, with privacy being so core to their model and with all of their developer resources, has a leak every now and then, as we see an example here. And it's not surprising that developers get it wrong, because there are many possible points of failure. So let's consider what happens when we want to enforce the simple policy that only my friends can see my GPS location. Well, to enforce this policy, we have to go all through the implementation and enforce it not just where we're looking at the location, but also where we are um, finding all users at a specific location or finding the most popular locations. And what's worse is that the policies are getting more and more complicated. We can have a policy that not just my friends can see my GPS location, but my friends who are nearby can see my GPS location in the next five hours. And so now the programmer has to keep this in mind all across the program. And some people might say, well, this is just a developer education problem. If we just taught developers how to do it right, everything would be good. I argue that it, the problem isn't that developers don't know how to enforce these policies. It's that they have to do it over and over again across the program. And if there's one thing we know in software engineering, it's that asking developers to do the same thing over and over again is error prone. And so let's think a little bit about how to fix this problem. If we could just worry about the policy without worrying about anything else, it actually isn't so complicated, right? And if we could think about the rest of the implementation without worrying about the policies, that is much simpler as well. And if we separated the two, what we would need then is a way to put them back together and uh, still produce the right results. And I'd like to point out that to do this, we need to be able to track information flow, because we're not just looking at the locations, but we're also looking at where they're flowing. And so what we want is a tighter coupling with the language semantics in order to automatically handle these policies. So in this talk, I will be describing Jeeves, a programming language for automatically enforcing these policies. And the key idea behind Jeeves is that you have multiple views of sensitive values, and you rely on the runtime to automatically use the right view. And so for my location, I can declare two different versions of it. Um, I can have my actual GPS location, and then I can have some other version of it that's more, uh, keeps me more private, like my country that I'm currently in or something like that. And then uh, the programmer can associate policies to protect my location. And this location can flow into the core program as any other value. And so we can find all users that are currently at Microsoft Research Cambridge um, over these locations without knowing what the policies on the locations are. And then the runtime becomes responsible for showing the right output given the user. So Andre, who is my friend and also near me right now, might be able to see that Bayern and I are here for the next five hours. And then my groupmate Rishab, who's not here um, and maybe is not even my friend, uh, sees only that I have no friends in this location right now. And so let's look a little bit about uh, at what this looks like in a program. And so what we have is um, we can introduce labels that get associated with sensitive values. And sensitive values have a high confidentiality component, a low confidentiality component, and the label guarding which one gets used. And uh, which label, uh, the value of the label can take on either high or low, depending on policies that are introduced with the label. And so here we have a policy on label A 
that um, has a label and takes a function of an output channel and a predicate describing when the label A is allowed to be high. And then the program can now use this location value as any other program value. And the runtime is responsible for producing the right output given the output channel. So Andre, uh, when the message is printed to him, should see my actual GPS coordinates or something like that, whereas Rishabh should just see that I am in the United Kingdom. And so uh, how the Jeeves runtime executes is we perform what we call faceted execution. And so the sensitive values are what we call faceted values. They have a high component, a low component, and a label. And every operator can now uh, deal with a faceted value along with a regular value. And how it does this is it looks at each component of the facet, executes on each of the facets, and then puts the result back together with the appropriate label. And in this way, we can also handle implicit flows because when we have a conditional executing on a faceted condition, we execute both branches and then we put the results back together. And uh, alongside this execution, the runtime stores policies by mapping labels to these functions. And then when it's time to output, the runtime produces a system of constraints by applying the policies to the output channel. And the runtime uses this to provide an assignment to the labels and then uses this assignment to figure out what's the appropriate value to project out in print. And so let's take a closer look at the policies to better understand what's going on there. And so here we have a policy that uh, for label A, we have the function that if the output channel is near me, then A is allowed to be high, right? And how this is handled is that it gets translated to this function that adds a constraint. If the output channel is not near me, then A has to be low. And so there are a couple things to note here. First of all, the policies might refer to sensitive values. And because here, um, my location might actually be sensitive. And so we have this interesting thing going on that if the output channel is near the sensitive location, then the sensitive location can be revealed. The other thing to note here is that all the policies take the form of restricting labels to low. And so um, what we have is that, first of all, we should observe that we always have a consistent assignment. If we assign the labels to low, if we assign all the labels to low, it's always consistent. And for this reason, we also have this notion of maximal functionality, which means that if we can assign something to high, we will try to assign it to high unless it conflicts with other assignments. And that way, we don't just show the lowest confidentiality outputs to all users at all times. And so now you might be wondering, OK, what does this mean more formally? And before we get into that, let's talk about what you might be expecting. So in classical information flow, we have this notion of lattices. We have a lattice of access levels. And so if you have a higher access level, you get access to more privileged information. So uh, level one is Andre and Byron. You know, they, they're employees. They get to know some stuff that everybody else in the world doesn't. At a higher level is, you know, maybe you have to have founded the company to, to know what's going on. And then at the highest level, well, if you live in the US, it's the NSA. They know everything that other people don't seem to know. And the, the property that people care about in programs like this is that, if you, um, is that outputs uh, are revealed at the right level, right? So let's say we have a piece of classified information at level three, only the NSA can see it, and we try to combine it with this Andy Warhol painting, which everyone can see. The result is this Andy Warhol uh, graph that's at level three, right? And we want to make sure that only the NSA can see it. And so this is what people tend to care about with these classical information flow properties, right? We have information, it's flowing, we want to make sure only the right people can see it. Jeeves is a little bit different because you always get some result, right? Uh, 
the thing is you have different versions of values flowing to the user and depending on what their level of access is, they get to see a different version of it. And so now we have to define this low confidentiality component for our graph and we have to associate it with some policies saying, hey, like only the NSA can see this graph, right? And now in Jeeves, when we combine it with this Andy Warhol painting, for the NSA, they get to see this really lovely Andy Warhol graph and then everybody else gets to see this equally lovely Andy Warhol access denied. Right, so, um, so our, our non-interference theorem takes into account the fact that we have this high component and this low component. And what we say is that if we have a sensitive value with a high component H and a low component L, given a fixed value of L um, and a label A, all executions where A must be low produce equivalent values no matter what the output, uh, no matter what the value of H is. And there's a subtle thing here that takes, well, not here, but in our actual theorem, that takes into account the fact that the value of the label A might actually depend on the value of H, as we saw with if you have a policy that depends on the distance or something else sensitive. And I'll explain in more detail in the next couple of slides what this means. And so let's think back to our policy of is near me and suppose it gets expanded out to something that says that restrict A uh, given the output channel if the distance between the output channel and my current location is less than 25 units, um, then A is allowed to be high, right? And so there's the case where we have the protected location and the viewer within 25 units of the protected location. And in this case, A is allowed to be high and this information is allowed to leak, right? There's also the case where the viewer is outside the radius of the protected location, right? And we're already leaking a little bit of information that, hey, you're outside the protected location and that's why you couldn't see the information. But what the viewer is not allowed to see is which of these locations outside the radius that the protected location actually is. And so what, what on our non-interference theorem says is that the high value is not flowing out to the viewer in this way so that if if it's allowing the label to be high then it does flow, if it doesn't allow the label to be high then you don't know which of those values in that space it was. And so we've been taking this and we've been playing around with this in the actual, uh, in actual implementations to make sure that you know, code actually does look better this way and it makes sense to program this way. And um, we have a couple of implementations right now. One is in Scala and one is in Python. I'll talk about some of the more details of this and also why we have two in a little bit. But the main idea behind the implementations is that we overload uh, operators to perform the faceted evaluation. So all you really need to do to embed this in a language is you take all your operators, you define what it means to do faceted evaluation on that, and you also have to keep track of a runtime environment that maps labels to policies. And then uh, what we do for effectful computations like print is we use Z3 to help us find uh, a satisfying assignment to all the labels that's consistent with the policies. And then we use this assignment to project out the value to print. And uh, we started with our Scala implementation first and we did a case study where we built a conference management system that was briefly uh, powering the PLDI 2012 student research competition, but then we stopped for some reasons I can talk about later. Um, and and what, what, we, what we built was a system where you have your policies and then you have your core functionality and the same code is showing different, different pages to different users, for instance, the reviewer and the authors. And what the, what the architecture of the system looks like is we had classes for defining the data types, uh, like the papers, the reviews, and the users. And the fields in those classes had the policies associated. For instance, um, all the people who are a part of reviewing the paper can see the titles, the um, authors cannot see the reviewer identities, and so on and so forth. 
and the context that we're using, the, the value that gets passed to the functions, has not just who's looking at it, but also the stage of the, con the conference. For instance, the submission stage, or the review, or the rebuttal, or the decision stage, or even the public stage, where everyone can see all of the accepted papers. And then the core program, then all that has to do is display papers, search over papers, add and remove tags, and um, assign and submit reviews. And so now the core program can be extended arbitrarily without having to worry about the policies. And if the, if the PC chair decides, hey, we're not doing double blind anymore, we're doing single blind, all he or she has to do is tweak code or tweak some options that changes code. Um, in the, in the data classes. And so uh, if you're interested in looking at lines of code in our system, uh, we, we use um, the Scalatra system for our front end and we used a Squirrel interface to a SQL database for our back end. We had almost 3,000 lines of code, uh, 128 lines of which was policy code. And by policy, policy code, I mean code that calls uh, make label or um, make sensitive or restrict for the policies. And the, the cool things here to note are that all the policy code is isolated in the data classes and also that the policy lines of code are less than 5% of the entire code. And if we chose to extend our conference management system, we would just be extending the functionality down here, most likely. And so this was built using our Scala web framework. And so we had our embedded domain-specific language in Scala. We used Scalatra for the front end, and we had Squirrel for the back end. Um, from these lessons, uh, we decided to build a, a Python web framework for a, a couple of reasons. One was that um, the, the web frameworks for Python are a little bit more mature. And also, there are some other reasons, like uh, there are a lot more undergrads who are willing to build web apps and Python and that sort of thing. But, but also Python, uh, there's some more other fun things about Python that I can talk about if you're, if you're interested. But, um, but we're currently working on this Python implementation that, um, that is like three quarters done. And so our, our goal is really to show that something like Jeeves can be used in a web framework where you're displaying different versions of data to different users. And uh, towards, this, towards this goal, we're looking at a couple of other things. And so the first of which is thinking about inputs as well as outputs. So, so far, I've talked about a system in which we have policies that allow the program to select which outputs get shown to which users, right? But what about writes into the system? And so the faceted machinery is actually pretty nice for putting policies on showing different versions of writes to different users. So here, if we have uh, reviewers writing new reviews into the system, it's really easy to create facets so that we're showing nothing to the author but something to the reviewer. And also, because facets allow you to store different versions of data, you can also imagine a case where in the decision phase or the rebuttal phase, you're, you're freezing the version of the review that you're showing to the author, but you're showing all the updates to another reviewer. And what gets even more interesting is that if you have a system of reviews, not just for a conference management system, but something like Yelp, and you have different kinds of users showing different kinds of reviews and scores to other users, and you can actually have a system where the viewers can specify what kinds of inputs they would allow to flow to them, and you can have policies that talk about both inputs and outputs so that you can have these selective views based not just on who's looking at it, but who wrote different values as well. So we've been working on this mechanism for a little while and we've implemented it. And it's based on uh, attaching policies to the mutable state. So the inputs to the system are associated with writes to the mutable state. We have policies that are associated with mutable reference cells. And what these policies look like is they are two, two argument functions that take now an input channel and an output channel and talk about both in terms of who can see what. So you can say if the input channel is friends with Alice, then the value can flow to the output. 
And you can also say something like, if the input channel is Alice and the output channel is friends with Alice, then this flow can occur. And there's some, uh, so there's some interesting things that happen, but we essentially have this guarantee as we had before that you have different versions of the system executing based on each new write, essentially. And you have the separation of the, the different versions. And we've been looking at a couple of case studies with, with these new write policies. So we have a basic authentication example. We extended our conference management example. And we also built this little battleship game where you have two users and they each have a board where you can put down ships and the locations of the ships are not revealed until you bomb the ship or the game is over. And what we found is that these write policies are pretty useful for, uh, so they essentially subsume confidentiality and integrity policies. You can, you can express all those policies that way. And also you have this nice separation of policy and other functionality that allows you to play with some other things. For instance, in the Battleship game, you can encode all of your game rules as policies. So for instance, I can see your, your ship if I've bombed, if both of us have put down our pieces, I've bombed your ship and, um, or the game is over, right? And the functionality then becomes, this is how you show the board, this is how you put down a ship, this is how you put down a bomb, and this is how you make a move. And so there are some interesting programming paradigm uh, ideas to think about with that as well. And another thing to note is that these policies talk not just about the principles that are making the, each move, but also uh, aspects of the game state, right? So this is what the board looks like. And so, so we found that to be pretty interesting as well. And so towards building a web framework, the final part of this is the interface with the database. And so uh, the thing that we noticed from building our web applications was that in order to not break our guarantees when, interact when interacting with the database, we essentially can only do select star from various tables, right? And if we really wanted to be safe, we would randomize the order of that as well. But if we wanted to build an application that scales, and uh, we want to have something that takes advantage of database optimizations, we'd really like to be able to write select star uh, from authors where, or from papers where the author is Gene Young or something like that. But you can imagine a case where in my runtime I have a policy that says that you can only know the author in these certain cases, but then with a query like this uh, that can be revealed through search or something, you can easily subvert those guarantees. Right, so what what we would like to do is for the database to have a notion of this high and low values and also the policies so that we can more optimally return the appropriate faceted values from the database without returning the entire database back into the runtime memory. And so we've been, we've been looking at some ideas for how we can represent this in the database, um, how, how we can optimize queries or how we can wrap around the database to make more optimal queries and, and that sort of thing. And so once we have all these pieces down, we should be able to be much closer to allowing the programmer to focus on the functionality of their programs rather than how to enforce the policies across all this. And so uh, all the people who are working on it at the current moment are these people. So there's me, there's my advisor, Armando Solar Lazama. There's uh, Travis, who's a master's student. He's working on the, the Python implementation. There's Ben, who was working on Scala web apps, and now he's working on Python web apps. And also, for the faceted semantics, we collaborated with Cormac Flanagan and, and his student, Tom Austin, at UC Santa Cruz. Um, and they had an initial non-policy, or they had initial faceted semantics that did not have to do with uh, solving for the labels. And so in this talk, I have described a mechanism for automatically enforcing privacy policies that's based on this idea of having multiple views of all of our values of interest and then relying on the runtime to handle these views so that the appropriate result is shown based on who's looking at it and also who has written it. 
I've described a semantics for a language that does this, as well as some guarantees and uh, some experience we've had with an implementation and some future directions with handling inputs and with interfacing with the database. And I'd like to leave off by saying that it's really exciting, I think, that language technology has brought us to a point where we can think about automating different concerns that are as global as information flow. And what I would like to think about with all of you, because I'm here for the rest of the week, is what other applications we can uh, have for something like this. And also, potentially, what other program aspects we can think about automating in this way. So thanks for coming. And I'll take questions. I have a question about, I mean, so, so I, I love the abstraction of the, the passive uh, sort of sensitive values. Um, so, so is there a way to understand that as a sort of by translation to a sort of standard system of, of information flow, you know, where values are just high or low and you don't have a sort of combination of the two? Right, so that's a, that's a good question. And I think that um, for, there's, there's a difference between this and standard systems because in standard systems for information flow, the idea is that you stop programs that are leaking too much information. And so there's not this idea of there's an alternate execution for, or there's an alternate way to produce a result for those programs. And so, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. But, but I'm thinking that your, your, your faceted value is sort of like a pair. I'm wondering if you could encode your faceted value as a pair in a conventional information flow system where you know, one half is high and the other half is low. Right, so, so uh, you could do that, except um, we found that often you, you should write these programs to handle the fact that you, your low value might be flowing through. For instance, um, you might want to use an option type instead of a regular value when you're, when, when you're doing something, or you might need to handle default values in a certain way. So, so from a programming perspective, um, you don't want to just take existing programs and, and put two values through, if that makes sense. But, um, but I think what you might be asking, though, is um, if it, I guess, if these guarantees map onto a more traditional program, is, yeah, I understand the, you don't want the abstraction. Right, I understand right. you want to hide the abstract, or you know, abstract away from the fact that it's a pair. But I'm wondering if, just semantically, we could think about it as a trans, you know, take your language and translate it to a conventional one, where you're passing around these pairs everywhere. So there's a little boilerplate that semantics introduces to, to do that. I, I see. I see. So I think a key difference with those also is that um, what what your high and low label is also can depend on your actual program value. And I think that dependence is uh, not captured, to my knowledge. From so, so conventionally, your your labels are just high or low, and and they're a concrete value, right? And they don't have to do with the program. But um, in our system, you can have these kind of weird dependencies of the of the policy on the program that I think is not traditionally expressed in in those information flow systems. Yeah. Labels. Right, right. We have dependent labels, essentially, yeah. So, yeah, so the, the, the programmer does have to be aware that they're programming in this system because the types of the values are probably going to change, yes? Yeah? Um, right, yes. Yeah. So, the, so uh, we found that you do want to program in a slightly different way uh, because you have to think about, okay, I might have a default value flowing through. Or in the case of the battleship example, it was sort of a wacky thing. Like you wouldn't program a game in this separated way normally. And so it's, it's a different way of implementing, right? So, so, so yeah, so I can see there is a, so you might move from like values to ranges of values for some things. Right, And right. sometimes you'll just bomb out and have an option. Right, right. And you can also uh, imagine, I guess, having a data type where you have different levels of, uh, of granularity. Like, this is my most fine-grained version, this is the, the next level of granularity, and this is my most, most secret private version or something like that. And there, I think there are interesting programming questions. Too. Sometimes the, um, the, the kind of weakened values, to adhere to the policy, you have to break kind of obvious normal invariants that will be associated with those types. Like, I mean, if I've got some state, right, then maybe the, I, get, I get a sort of faked up low version because I didn't want to reveal this thing. But, right. but then either, either you're kind of building some shadow, you know, shadow file system, say, for example, you know, the thing says it needs access to the file system and I want to deny that. But then maybe writes to the file system kind of appear to work 
but then when I read, I don't see the consistent thing unless you spin up a whole kind of parallel universe. Right, right. Yeah, so I think there's, uh, there's, there's some interesting programming idiom questions to be answered there, um, especially with, with the right stuff that we're looking at now. Um, you know, if you wrote to the system, but actually, you know, no one, no one is seeing it, should, you know, should something else be happening? Should we bundle these rights in some way so that we're, we can communicate that, hey, this weird thing is happening? But yeah, there's, um, this is a space of questions that we're, we're actively looking at. And if you want to talk more, I'd be happy to talk more, yeah. So do you have to run the whole SMC solver component um, every time a, a new channel, I guess, up a channel is created? Uh, so right right now we do, okay. um, but I think there are uh, ways to cache this and, and that sort of thing. And do you think you could kind of modify, um, is, do you think that this framework needs to pervade the whole application? It could be somewhat isolated in the sense that, you know, if I think about applying this to Facebook, I'm sure they have millions of lines of code <laughs> in, in, in many different languages, right? So, so it's, it seems... Um, cumbersome to apply something like this to their entire code base, but your example of the databases seem to indicate that it may be difficult to isolate. Right, so I think, I, I guess if there are uh, isolated data, or you can isolate it in, in a, like, like a strongly connected data component, you know, like if this data only depends on each other, then we can isolate this there. But if you have different parts of the system touching the same data, then you really want your policies to pervade through that whole thing. And in that case, I don't think you should isolate it. And I also think that a lot of bugs in systems come from having, uh, having these policies break at the boundaries of these things. And so I think you should really, yeah, for, for data that depends on each other, it should really, uh, you should be looking at this across that whole, whole part of the system. With this, can you nest the facets so you've got, um, yeah, okay. And if you do nest them, do you do any checks for like unreachability? Because your policy might mean one of the values can't actually ever get there because, say, the outer policy requires you to go to the right hand side, and then the inner one only ever will let you go left if you've gone because well, one policy subsumes the other or something. Right, I see. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. So you can nest the facets, and we don't do any analysis right now for unreachability. But I think that would be a good way to sanity check the system. Like, hey, did you really mean this policy? So, yeah, that's a. But any of your examples did you nest facets? Uh, we didn't nest facets for any of these examples. But um, I guess another another thing to point out is that in the evaluation, what you get as a result is usually a nested, a nested facet tree where you have different facet values that got combined. So I have one. So, so you were saying that uh, um, this uh, equality overloading was essentially the trick to hide pairs so that right, inside right. the runtime. Imagine you have a language that doesn't have uh, operator overloading. Would it be possible basically just to do a source for source transformation, plug in all this stuff? Right, so, so essentially for Python, we had to start doing a source transform because you can't overload and and or which is pretty important. Um, yeah, so, so you can, so yeah, you can do it with a source transform. And do you have any, any uh, data on so that actually, what's the runtime overhead of calling Z3 every time you do print? Um, so the, the runtime of calling Z3 is actually pretty low. So um, what we did in our Scala implementation was that we evaluated things uh, pretty much all the way. We, we did a full simplification pass. And so Z3 was only called to resolve the label values, which is, um, and then we're only defining Booleans and uh, assigning, like, or having a pretty small constraint environment. It was always like milliseconds or something like that, yeah. So, so we weren't using Z3 in any significant way at all. And in fact, um, before we added the simplifications, the bottleneck in our previous approach was the, the communication with Z3 and not the Z3 solving time. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on the side channel attacks? Like um, so we haven't looked at that uh, very carefully, but right now an interesting thing is, I guess um, for in terms of timing, you. Um, since you're executing everything, you don't really infer stuff about the private value because you, you do both sides. And so in that way, um, that sort of obfuscates some timing issues. 
And also for, for termination, um, you're executing both branches. And so if, if some branch doesn't terminate, your whole thing is not going to terminate. Um, so, so I guess that's, that's our current understanding of it. But, but I think especially as we look at some optimizations and we drop branches and things like that, um, we're going to need to look at side channels more carefully. Before you close, I did have a comment. So this is a funny thing because during the security push, sort of post-security push days, way back when Zed3, Zapod, all these things were being developed, we got away, we didn't have to go through a security review of Z3. And huh. now it's kind of a nightmare because now Z3 is apparently quite crucial to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I'll, we'll, we'll keep that in mind when we decide whether to keep Z3 in our system. Thanks. <laughs>